Well, it's good to be with you today. And I have a word that I want to share with you that came as I was reading uh, the one-year Bible this past week. I, I read a different one than probably most people are reading right now because I'm reading the chronological one-year Bible. And I was reading about a man in the book of Numbers that I'm going to talk to you about. And as I read that story that we're going to jump into, and this is going to be a little bit different today. I'm not going to be long in my message. Now, I want to say first and foremost, this was supposed to be one long message and I made it into two part message. So that's why I'm not going to be very long. Don't hold me to the standard of a 25 to 30 minute message every Sunday now. I'm preaching a short message today because at the last minute, I decided to cut this message in half because it was too long to all be one message. So we're going to preach part two next week. But I want to share with you something that a burden that I've had in my heart that came through in this uh, story that I read in the Old Testament. And it's a burden for prayer and for us as the body of Christ to understand the biblical context for prayer and our role in prayer according to what the Word of God says. We have to be careful with prayer because prayer unchecked can be detrimental. It can actually cause casualties if we pray not in the way that Jesus taught us how to pray. And so I want us to look at Scripture today and see how we really should be praying. The title of my message today is a little bit snarky, but you're going to understand as I get into the message why I titled it this way. But the title of my message is, Your Kingdom Come, My Will Be Done, Prayer or Sorcery. That's the subtitle. Your kingdom come, my will be done, and then prayer or sorcery. Now, I want to talk to you today about a man who is a very peculiar character in the Bible that we only see in two books of the Bible, and then again, refer reference one time later on, or actually two times in the same book, and then reference later on in the book of Revelation. And this man is the man named Balaam found in Numbers chapter 22, and we're going to start reading in verses 1 through 6. But before I do, I want to give you a little bit of context as to what's happening here. At this point, Moses is leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, right? They're going through the wilderness. They're experiencing difficulty. The serpents are biting them, all of the things that they went through. But despite the difficulty that they were going through, the favor of God was still on his people. Even though they were complainers, which God hates, they were murmurers, which God cannot stand, right? They had a bad attitude most of the time, but God was still giving them favor because even while they were going through the wilderness, the Bible says they were encountering people in the wilderness. There were people who were coming against them in the wilderness. There were armies of people, savages that lived out in the wilderness. But every time they encountered these people, because the favor of God was on them, God gave them the victory. And so we see God giving them victory after victory up until this point. Now we're at Numbers 22, verses 1 through 6. It says, Then the people of Israel traveled to the plains of Moab and camped east of the Jordan River across from Jericho. Balak, son of Zippor, the Moabite king, had seen everything the Israels did to the Amorites. And when the people of Moab saw how many Israelites there were, they were terrified. The king of Moab said to the elders of Midian, this mob will devour everything in its sight like an ox devours grass in the field. So Balak, king of Moab, sent messengers to, uh, to call Balaam, son of Beor, who was living in his native land of Pethor near the Euphrates River. His message said, look, a vast horde of people has arrived from Egypt. They cover the face of the earth and are threatening me. Please come to curse these people for me because they are too powerful for me. Then perhaps I will be able to conquer them and drive them from the land. I know that blessings fall on any people you bless and curses fall on people you curse. Now, I want to pause right there with my first point this morning. When we let people believe that we are the source of power, eventually we will start to believe it. When you let people believe you are the source of the power that is inside of you, oops, that was a powerful demonstration I just did with my mic. When you let people believe you are the source of the power inside of you, eventually you will start to believe it too. 
And we see this happen again and again in society, not just as it relates to the power of God, but it can be anything. We can see people of influence that, that have a meteoric rise. And then all the people around them say, you're so good. You're such a great communicator. You're such a powerful leader. You're so... And all of these wonderful things, these accolades that they obtain, and they start to believe those things, not realizing that it was God who put them on the platform to begin with not realizing that it was God who gave us the skill sets that we had to begin with. And again, it's not just with preachers. It's not just with public figures. It can be, I'm such a great dad. Look at my kids. Look at the way they're being brought up, which by the way, this is strictly hypothetical. I don't feel this way on any given day, but I'm giving you an example. Maybe you do feel this way. I'm such a wonderful parent. Look at how I have it all together. Look at my little angels and how perfect they are at all times, Right? And you can begin to hear that so much from other people around you. You're so good. Whatever you bless is blessed. Whatever you curse is cursed. And people are looking to you as the source of that blessing and you as the source of that curse rather than looking at the one who gives us the power and speaks through us. Can I tell you something? We're just vessels. That's all. We're just vessels. We don't have any power. The power is not ours. It comes through us, right? Right? And so the same is true of you being such a wonderful parent. The same is true of you being such a wonderful spouse. But the problem is, again, we hear people around us say, man, you guys have such great chemistry. How have you kept that up for so many years? How do you keep that spark alive? Or how about you're such a genius in your career? You're so good at your field. Oh, this hobby you've mastered that you're an incredible athlete. All these things that we start to hear, the danger becomes when we begin to believe that we are the source of those things. Can I tell you something? Every Every good thing that is going on in your life, every good thing that has ever happened in my life, I am not the source of because there's nothing good that comes from this flesh. There's nothing good that comes from this earth. Everything good comes from above. We just so happen to have the ability and the luxury and the privilege to be recipients of all of these good things and vessels of these good things. But when we hear it so much again and again and again, we start to believe it. Now, here's the danger. Here's the danger. If you believed it was your power that got you to the mountaintop, then it's going to take your power to get you out of the pit. Because we're going to be in the pit at some point. And we're going to be on the mountaintop at some point, but we're not going to stay at either place. However, when we start to believe that it is our strength and our accolades and our intelligence and our skill set and our abilities that got us to where we are, when we fall, not if we fall, when we fall, when we go through the valley, because we will, we're going to have to rely on our own power. And many people are in the pit right now. And you're frustrated because you can't get yourself out of the pit because you made the mistake of believing that it was your ability that got you to the mountain. It was not. It was the power of God in the pit that you find yourself in today. Only the power of God will be able to reach down and pull you up out of it. So the more you try in your own strength, the more you try in your own ability, the more we fight, and I'm speaking to myself because I do it all the time, the more I bang my head on the brick wall and say, I can do this, I can figure it out, there's got to be a formula. Let me tell you something, there is no formula. And this is the tension that people like me find themselves in on a regular basis. It's a tension that we live with. It's one that says, I really need to develop my, my, my skills. I really need to self-improve. I need to self-educate. I need to read more books. And we start arguing within ourselves of, yeah, but God is calling me to this. Yeah, but this makes more sense. If I can just develop the skill set, if I can read my way out of this problem, and if I can find the solution in these books, if I can develop enough intellect, if I can refine my skills enough, I know I can climb my way out of this pit. And the problem is, we didn't get ourselves to the mountain, so we don't have the ability to get ourselves out of the pit. It's not going to come from earthly means. It's going to come from him. And so the best thing we can do when we find ourselves in a pit season, in a valley season, is say, Lord, I look to you. Yes. I'm not looking to divination, right? Figuring out on my own. So when we let people believe that we are the source of power, eventually we start to believe it too. 
This is applicable with the gospel as well. This is applicable with the ministry. When we let people believe that we are the source of the revelation that God gives us, right? As preachers, well, this came from me and oh, that was a great message. When we start to believe it too, the problem is then we carry the weight and the pressure of the gospel. Did you know there's a lot of weight that comes along with the gospel? There's a lot of pressure that comes along with the gospel, but that pressure isn't yours to carry, nor is it your weight to carry. I see pastors many times that are being interviewed on, 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 t- on television regarding difficult topics, controversial topics, hot topics in society, right? Around homosexuality, around abortion, around these things. And the problem is with pastors who have taken it upon themselves to explain the gospel and to to carry the weight of the gospel, they try and explain. Listen, it's not on us to explain. What does the Bible say? That's what we preach. That's it. That's our guide for life is what does the Bible say around these things? And if I've I've often thought to myself, if I've ever been asked, hey, what's your opinion on homosexuality and homosexual marriage? My response would be irrelevant. My opinion is irrelevant. What is the Bible's opinion? What is God's opinion? That's what I'm going to preach. And that's what I'm going to stand by. That's what we have to stand by in love but we can't shy away from it because I can't take on the pressure and the weight of the word that I didn't write. It's not my weight to carry. It's his weight to carry. I'm just a messenger. So I just get to preach what's in it, not deviate from it, not shy away from it, not try and and package it in a way that I think will be relevant to society and relevant to culture. No, all I have to do is this is what the word of God says. And this is what I'm going to preach. We can't rely on our own power. Let's keep reading our story. Numbers 22, and we're going to look at verse 7 through 20 now. Balak's messengers, who were elders of Moab and Midian, set out with money to pay Balaam to place a curse upon Israel. They went to Balaam and delivered Balak's message to him. Stay here overnight, Balaam said. In the morning, I will tell you whatever the Lord directs me to say. So the officials of Moab stayed there in Balaam with Balaam. That night, God came to Balaam and asked him, who are these men visiting you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me with this message. Look, a vast horde of people has arrived from Egypt and they cover the face of the earth. Come and curse these people with earth for me. Then perhaps I will be able to stand up to them and drive them out of the land. Look, look at this, verse 12. But God told Balaam, do not go with them. You are not to curse these people for they have been blessed. Let me read verse 12 again, just in case there's any confusion. So we get it all out and it's very clear. Verse 12, but God told Balaam, do not go with them. You are not to curse these people for they have been blessed right there. That's the will of God. God has expressed his will. God has made it clear. And to many of us, God has already given us his will and direction for our lives through his word. See, there are certain things that we have to pray and say, God, what do you want for this? What are you? But then there are other things that we already know what the will of God is, right? We already know the, 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 the will that God has for our lives in certain regards as it relates to infirmity. It's God's will for us to be healed, according to Isaiah 53, 5, right? There are scriptures in the Bible that tell us certain things that are definite. This is what God, this is how God feels about marriage. This is how God feels about sexual purity. This, there are things in the Bible that we know, okay, this is the will of God. And anything other than that is contrary to the word of God. Therefore, it's not his will. But there are other specific things in our lives where we need direction that we have to say, God, what is your will? So in verse 12, God is telling Balaam, Balaam do not go with them. You are not to curse these people for they have been blessed. Verse 13, the next morning, Balaam got up, told Balak's officials, go on home. The Lord will not let me go with you. So the Moabite officials returned to King Balak and reported Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak tried again. This time he sent a larger number of even more distinguished officials. I want you to notice that. More distinguished officials than those he had sent the first time. They went to Balaam and delivered this message to him. This is what what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Please don't let anything stop you from coming to help me. 
I will pay you very well and do whatever you tell me. Just come and curse these people for me. But Balaam responded to Balak's messengers, even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. Look at this, verse 19. But, everybody say but. Stay here one more night and I will see if the Lord has anything else to say to me. That night, God came to Balaam and told him, since these men have come for you, get up and go with them. Do not, or do, but do only what I tell you to do. Now, there's a lot happening here. There is this conflict happening where it's interesting to note that he sent more distinguished officials now. And so what does that tell us? It gives us a little insight into the character of Balaam here. He's clearly moved by status and power. There are some people that when they are among people of status and power, they become different people altogether. I've seen it. I know it, right? Because I used to be the type. It's like when you come into a place with people of influence, suddenly you just tense up and you put your foot in your mouth and you say stupid stuff. Why? Because you, you, are again guilty of the, th- the same thing Balak's officials were good. Anyone you say be cursed, anyone you say be blessed, we associate the gift with favor and blessing from God. And there can be a gift at work without God's favor and blessing on it. And so people become awestruck, right? And that's how this man was. They, he, he knew, the king of Moab knew, if I send more distinguished officials, then my, way, my word is going to carry more weight. If I send people with more money, right? The Bible says they brought more things. They offered him more money. Just name your price. Let me tell you something. Money will never move me. It won't. It used to. It used to be a driver for me. It used to be a motivator for me. But I've seen how seemingly for over a year and a half with barely any income, God has taken care of me. So that tells me that God controls it all anyway. So if someone of influence wants to try and use money against me, it'll never work because I know that ultimately everything that they have, the mountain that they're sitting on, God put them on to begin with. And just like that, God can raise up another to fund his kingdom and do his work. So don't be like Balaam, influenced by money and status, right? Because that's what's happening here. It's not enough for us to submit to the will of God. And just stop there with that. It's not enough. It's not enough for us to just submit to the will of God if, everybody say if, if if our desires don't also align with his. Because we can submit begrudgingly. And many of us have done that and are probably still doing that. We can submit begrudgingly. It's like, it's like let's, let's read what he said here. Even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. Now, he's not saying no. Dude, you're crazy. I'm not going to curse God's people. I don't want to do that. Are you nuts? He's not saying that. He's saying even if he gave me everything, I don't have the power to go against God. I really wish I could. I really wish I could, but I don't have the power to do it. That's what he's saying here. And then he says, but stay here. When he said, but stay here one more night, that showed the desire of his heart. The desire of his heart was that he would be able to mold the will of God to fit his narrative, to curse the people of God. Why? Influence, status, money. But stay here. Maybe God will change his mind. It's like, I know I can't change. And we many times go into prayer with that kind of posture. It's like, we know the will of God. We know what is true according to the word of God, but maybe just maybe God will bend it this time. And we go to God in prayer and we try and twist God. And I'm telling you this morning, it's not enough for us to submit to his will. We have to pray that God would change our desires. 
We have to pray that our desires would align with God's, that we would no longer want to do what we want to do, but just submit because we know that the alternative is destruction. We know that the alternative is devastation. We know that the alternative is lack. So I'm going to do what God wants me to do, but I really don't want to do it. Right? It's like Cain and Abel. The difference in the offerings, one that gave out of love because he wanted to give God his best and one who gave because he was obligated to do it because it was the law, because if he didn't do it, he was going to be in trouble. God looks at the heart and you can only submit out of fear and out of obligation for so long because it's not intended to be that way anymore. That's how it was pre-Jesus Christ. That's how it was intended to be before the, the, the sacrifice of the lamb. We had to obey. We had to submit atonement for our sins through the sacrifice of innocence. We had to. There was no relationship between God and his people. God wanted a relationship with his people. But again, and again, his people pushed him away. When Moses went up, they said, no, you go, Moses. You be our advocate because we can't get in the presence of God. When the people demanded God give them a king, it was never God's original intent to give them a king. There were only judges. God was to be their king. But the people said, no, all the other nations have a king. We want a king too. God's intent was to be among his people. So we, gotta, we have to change our hearts. And that's the definition of true repentance. It's a change of mindset. It's when we say, you know what? I don't want to just obey out of obligation. I want to obey out of a loving relationship of intimacy with my Savior. I want to be in relationship. Because obedience uh, without desire is just a relationship less obedience. God doesn't want you to obey without a relationship. God wants you to obey out of love for him and out of understanding as to why it is that you're obeying to begin with. Listen, I can remember as a kid not being allowed to do anything. Somebody say anything. anything. Type in the chat, anything. What were you not allowed to do? Anything. I couldn't stay at my friend's houses. I couldn't watch PG-13 rated movies at 16 years old. I couldn't do, listen, I couldn't do anything and I hated it. We don't do that. Why don't we do that? Because we're different. Why are we different? Because we're called. Why are we called? It was just, we weren't allowed to do anything, right? My sister's laughing in the back, but it's true. All the stuff our cousins got to do. Listen, our cousins were church kids. Our cousins were pastor's kids. Our cousins were in the ministry, but they got to do stuff we didn't get to do. They got to play video games we didn't get to play. I mean, we were overboard on lockdown. And I'm not going to do that to my kids, just to be clear on that. We were overboard, overboard. But at that time, I hated it. However, at this time, I love that I went through that. I love that that was my parents' stance. Why? Because I see now because I understand now. At that time, I was in conflict with my parents. Didn't make sense. I didn't like that they weren't letting me have fun. I didn't like that they weren't letting me hang out with the friends I wanted to hang out with. I didn't like that they weren't letting me go to the places I wanted to go. And again, in fairness to me, I think my parents were a little bit overboard, but I understand why they did it now. I understand and I appreciate why they did it. Am I going to do things exactly the same way? No, I'm not. I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to do things the way I feel God wants me to do them with my children. But I'm also not raising children in a third world country where literally there are human sacrifices taking place and crazy kinds of witchcraft and all kinds, and where women are petitioning me as a 13-year-old boy to give them a grandbaby. True story. 13 years old. I remember, never mind, not even going to get into it. My point is, at that time, I didn't understand it because I was in conflict with my parents and I was obeying out of obligation. Today, I am in fellowship with my parents. And as such, I am able to see why they did what they did. God wants to bring you, oh, I feel the presence of God. God wants to bring you out of a place of strife and conflict with him into a place of fellowship with him so that you can understand why it is that you're doing what he wants you to do so that you can understand why it is that you're obeying him to begin with, so that there won't be strife and tug of war in prayer. Yes, in prayer. Did you know you can be praying against God and against his will? 
And God's saying, this is my will for you. And you don't understand why he's saying that. So it doesn't make sense to you. So you say, surely that can't be God's will. No, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of you, I'm going to make you go against yourself. Hence my title today. Your kingdom come, my will be done. We want to utilize the resources of God's kingdom to fulfill our will here on earth. And we got to be careful with this in charismatic movements. Thus says the Lord. Oh, God have mercy. We have to be careful with that. Thus says the Lord, X, Y, Z. You have to understand the weight that those words preceding any statement that comes out of your mouth carry. When you say the words, thus says the Lord, you have to understand the weight that that has. So many people just throw around, thus says the Lord this, thus says the Lord that. And I have been victim of thus says the Lord almost destroying my life because I believed it. Thus says the Lord, this is what you're supposed to do with your life. Let me tell you something. Thus says the Lord does not apply unless thus says the Lord to you first. If someone's telling you, thus says the Lord, this is the will for your life, but God doesn't confirm it to you, run away from it. Thank you for that word. God bless you. But if thus really says the Lord, he's going to say it to my spirit because I have the advocate named Jesus. See, now he's the mediator between God and man. There's no Moses anymore. You don't need a Moses. So many people want to walk from church to church being everyone's Moses. This is the message of God for your church. This is the message God has for your life. I don't need you to tell the message that God has for my life. God bless you. I appreciate the heart. I appreciate where it's coming from. But I have Jesus. And the apostle Paul said, now there is only one mediator between God and man. One. Not one in all his little junior mediators. No, one mediator between God and man, and it is Christ Jesus. And so anytime someone comes at you with a, thus says the Lord, this is the will of God for your life, just be polite. Don't shut them down unless you're me. I'll shut them down because I'm the pastor of this church. But if you're not the pastor of the church, just come and tell me, and then I'll shut them down because we're not going to have that. We're not going to have all these voices with thus says the Lord this. And I'm not at all against prophecy or prophetic words in the church. Absolutely not. I'm completely for it, but I'm for it in the biblical context. Outside of the biblical context, this is a nonprofit church, but inside of the biblical context, the Holy Spirit has full rule and reign to move however he wants to move. But let me tell you, he's going to speak to the leadership of this church first. That's it. So if, if you're hearing a word that is different than what is coming from the leadership of the church, then you need to come tell the leadership of the church because we're not going to, we're going to squash that immediately because it's dangerous. I'm telling you, there is a fine line between divination and prayer. What is divination? It's sorcery. It's sorcery. And what you have to understand is there is a spiritual realm that can be accessed from two different ways, divination and prayer, divination and, and prophetic prayer. And how you access it is determined by the spirit in which it's accessed. So if you're accessing it out of, I need a word, but you're coming into it already with a manipulative posture, what do I mean by that? When we come to God for direction, wanting an answer, that has the potential to be sorcery. And let me reread that again. When we come to God wanting an answer, wanting an answer, that has the potential to be sorcery. I'm going to say it again. When we come to God for direction in our lives, wanting an answer, a specific answer, that has the potential to be sorcery. Because then we start praying manipulatively. We start praying for that answer to come to pass. And that's our will. That is our control. That's where the spirit of control comes in and says, I'm praying for direction, but God, I really want you to. No, 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 no. Get rid of that but God. And just say, God, I want your will. That's a pure prayer. That's a prayer that has no other uh, alter alternative motives, ulterior motives. It's a, it's, a, it's a prayer that just says, God, I want your will, not mine, your will. These are my preferences. And listen, there's nothing wrong with telling God your preferences. God's not a dictator either that's going to say, you better pray my will if you don't. No, no, no. You tell him your preferences. Lord, this is what I would like to see happen. Nevertheless, I want your will above mine. 
I'm not going to pray and hammer my will into, into fruition, into passing. And, and, and I'm not going to push it through like I always hear on the news. And, and Congress pushed the bill through. I'm not going to have to force anything through. And that leads me to my next point. Numbers 22 through 21. I'm getting ready to close now. So the next morning, Balaam got up and saddled his donkey and started off with the Moabite officials. But God was angry that Balaam... Now listen, let, let me pause here. Let's, let's read the, the last verse of the last um, passage we just read. Verse 20, actually, if we go back. The night, that night, God came to Balaam and told him, since these men have come for you, get up and go with them and do only what I tell you to do. Right? That's what God... So God is telling him, go ahead and go. Now, this is a dangerous place to be. Because where did Balaam go wrong? Anybody know? He went wrong when he got the first message because that's when he should have cut it off and said, I'm not cursing God's people. Goodbye. That's it. But he entertained it. He didn't say yes to it, right? Now, listen, I'm preaching for a moment. He didn't say, oh, yeah, I'll do that. He entertained it. Some of us got to stop entertaining the things that are pulling us away from the will of God for our lives. Well, I didn't say yes to it, though. I didn't, I didn't cross the line. Yeah, but you entertain the line. You entertain the voice on the other side of the line. Don't entertain it. Don't entertain it because when we even so much as entertain it, it opens up a foothold into our lives. It, it, it comes in and then starts uh, playing with us. So, so where Balaam went wrong is he should have said at the very beginning of this chapter, you've got the wrong guy. Go look for someone else. I will never curse the people of God. Why? Because you know that's not God's will. Look at the blessing of God on them. Look at how God's giving them victory. Now you want me to curse them. That's not for me. Go get somebody else. I'm out. But he didn't do that. So verse 20, that night God came to Balaam and told him, since these men have come for you, get up and go with them, but do only what I tell you to do. Now this is a dangerous place to be because some would read that and interpret, well, God's with them now. Some would read that and say, well, it's God's will for him to go now because God is saying, no, no, no. Let me explain to you what's happening. Dad, can I please go out with my friends? Dad, can I please go out with my friends? Dad, can I go ride bikes with my friends? Please, dad, can I go with my friends? No, son, no, son, no, son. Dad, please, can I just go? Fine, go. Are we familiar with the dynamic? Anybody? Right? I know that dynamic all too well from, from the dad, can I please go side. I don't know it yet from the fine go side, but I know it from the dad, can I please go? And the thing that was always uh, a little bit scary to me at that age when I would say, dad, please, dad, can I please, dad, is when he finally said, yeah, go, it was like bittersweet because I'm like, ah, I'm allowed to go, but oh, I'm scared to go because something inside of me knew it wasn't right. I'm going to give you an example of this. I was about nine or 10 years old. We were at a Haitian village in the Dominican Republic that also had no pure water. Very common theme for down there. And the only source of water for this town was a, a, um, it was a ravine, like a canal that was probably about the width of this room. And it was about six feet deep. And it was literally made out of concrete on the sides and mud at the bottom. And, and there were pigs in it. There were pigs bathing in this. There, there were all kind of animal fecal matter, dead animals floating down. But the kids of the village were all in their underwear doing flips off the side of the canal into the water. And they were having so much fun. And they loved it. And they were Haitian. And I'm not. And I said, and guess what? By the way, they grew up there. They were born there in those huts. They had immunities that I didn't have. But I said, dad, please, can I get in the water? Dad, please, let me go swimming. Dad, please, they really want me to go. Dad, please, dad, please, dad, please. No, son, no, son, no, son. Dad, please, fine, go. And that's where Balaam is in this story. It's like he should have just said no from the beginning, but he kept entertaining, kept entertaining. He was enticing. They offered him a lot of money. Fine, go. And I remember I jumped off the side of this bridge. There was a little bridge going over the canal. I jumped off and I was having so much fun and I'm swimming around and I'm doing backflips. And, and that night I was throwing up and I had diarrhea and it was coming out both sides. And then I got a skin disease from being in there. And then I got pink eye and an ear infection. True story. My parents can validate it. 
And let me tell you something. Many of us find ourselves in a very similar position. God, please. God, would you please let this come to pass? God, please. And there's nothing wrong with praying like the woman and the unjust judge. God, Jesus tells us to do that. But he also says, don't pray like the Gentiles who use vain repetitions, thinking that that will somehow move God. So we have to learn how to discern the difference between pleading for God on behalf of his own will, because we have to pray his will to come to pass, versus using vain repetition to make our agenda come to pass. There's a difference. And how do we discern and how do we know the difference? The only way to know the difference is to either be in relationship with him or not. If we are in relationship with him, we will know how. Same thing I just told you about my parents and me. We're in relationship together. What does that mean? I'm a parent now. So we have commonalities. We have common ground. We see things the same. Why? Because we are in relationship. We are in unity. The Holy Spirit wants you to be in unity with him so that you can perceive and understand what his will is. Yes, you have a mandate to pray his will to come to pass. This is a battle. You are a soldier. You have to pray. You will struggle. It will be difficult. You've got to pray it through, but you have to make sure that you're praying his will, not ours. Because to pray our own will is divination, as we're going to read in the story next week. So it's not enough for us to submit to the will of God, we also have to, our desires have to align with his. Numbers 22, verses 21 through 29, as we close. The next morning, Balaam got up, saddled his donkey, and started off with the Moabite officials. But God was angry that Balaam was going. So he sent his angel, the angel of the Lord, to stand in the road to block his way. So Balaam and two servants, and I want you to notice that, I'm pointing out the fact that he was not alone, he had two servants with him, were riding along. Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword <coughs> in his hand. The donkey bolted off the road into a field, but Balaam beat it and turned it back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood at the place where the road narrowed between the two vineyard walls. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by and crush Balaam's foot against the wall. So Balaam beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved further down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get by at all. This time, when the donkey saw the angel, it lay down under Balaam. In a fit of rage, Balaam beat the animal again with his staff. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. What have I done to you to deserve you beating me three times? It asked Balaam. Look at this. You have made me look like a fool, Balaam shouted. If I had a sword with me, I'd kill you. Let me tell you something. When you do it in your own strength, you become hyper-concerned about the opinions of other people around you. How do I know if I'm in the spirit or in my own strength? Well, if I'm in the spirit, I don't care what people around me think because I know I'm doing what he called me to do. When I'm in my own strength and I'm out of the will of God, you made me look like a fool, right? His servants were with him. And we start to wonder as we're riding along on the donkey, what are they thinking of me? Right? There's this insecurity that goes with us. Are they going to think that I'm a real prophet? Are they going to think that I really hear the voice of the God? Or are they going to think that I'm... Why? There's this internal struggle that's going on. God doesn't want you to live in turmoil. God doesn't want you to live with this internal struggle inside of you. He's called us to live in peace. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. We're supposed to live in peace. Does that mean that we're going to not face difficulty? No, we will face difficulty. But the evidence that we are in the spirit and we're doing his will is that he will give us peace in the midst of the difficulty. How many have ever faced a difficult situation before? Did you have peace in it? It depends. Were you living in communion with his spirit or were you not? My answer is yes and no. There were times when I was in a difficult situation where I had no peace, but I wasn't living submitted to Christ. The times when I was, I had total peace and it made no sense. And so peace is the evidence. Peace is the evidence. God wants us to have peace. And when we don't, when we are in relationship with him and in agreement with his will, we're not going to care what people around us think. 
There's this frustration that comes along with not being in the will of God. He's beaten the crap out of this donkey. He's beaten the crap out of the King James Version says his ass. That's what the Bible says. I almost pulled up the King James Version just to show you. He's beating his own ass into submission, literally. But when you're doing what God called you to do, you don't have to beat anything. You don't have to force it. It's going to happen. Numbers 22, 30 through 36. But I am the same donkey you have ridden all your life. The donkey answered, have I ever done anything like this before? No, Balaam admitted. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before him. Why did you beat your donkey those three times? The angel of the Lord demanded. Look, I have come to block your way because you are stubbornly resisting me. Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I would have certainly killed you by now and spared the donkey. Then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned and I didn't realize you were standing in the road to block my way. I will return home if, everybody say if, if you're against my going. If I'm against you, I already told you not to go, right? But he still doesn't see it. But the angel of the Lord told Balaam, go with these men, but say only what I tell you to say. What's happening here? He's not done teaching this guy a lesson because he still hasn't gotten it. So he says, so Balaam went on with Balak's officials. When King Balak, or Balak heard that Balaam was on the way, he went out to meet him at the Moabite town on the Arnon River at the farthest border of his land. Now, he says, go on and go. Go on and go. Why did he say go on and go? Because he says, if you're still, if you're not for this, I'll go back. He hadn't gotten it yet. And as we're going to see in chapter, what is this, 22, 23, next week, when we look through the rest of this story, there's a moment where he has a wake up call and he has a realization. And that's the point that God is getting him to. But he had to go through some stress. He had to go through some turmoil. He had to go through some difficulty before he finally got the revelation and realized what was going on. And so what we need to do is stop struggling because when it's God's will, you won't have to force those with you into submission. They will gladly go. And that's my final point today. When it's the will of God, you won't have to force those with you into submission. They'll gladly go. Why? Because they'll see that it's God's will. They'll know that it's God's will. They'll feel that it's God's will when it's the will of God. Whenever you're having to beat it into submission and constantly force it, that's not God's will. It doesn't mean we won't have battles. We absolutely will have battles. But if we are in relationship with him, then we will pray the way that he wants us to pray. We'll pray for his will to come to pass, not our own will. I want to lead you in prayer today. If you were saying, you know what, I've never even made the decision to follow Jesus before. I've heard of this. I, I, I you know, I, I've, I've heard of it on Easter when I go to church once a year, or I've heard of it on Christmas when I go to church once or twice a year, but I've never had a relationship with this Jesus. I want to give you the opportunity to open up your heart and accept him in as your Lord and Savior right now. It's simple. You don't have to even repeat the prayer if your heart is in the right place. It's not about the words. It's about the heart. So if you believe that Jesus Christ is real, if you have questions about whether he is or not, but you want to know him, if he is real, I want you to open up your heart right now. Just have an open mind and an open heart and repeat this short prayer after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I come humbly before you, acknowledging that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I repent right now. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to wash me. And I ask you to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I need a savior because I'm lost. I repent right now and I choose to follow you. I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I might have your power, not mine, to live for you every day of my life. And know that one day I'll spend eternity with you. I believe Jesus came to this earth in the flesh. 
He died on the cross. And on the third day, he rose again. And because of that sacrifice, I can have eternal life with you. And I can have power here on this earth. I receive it now by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, we want to welcome you today into our family, into the kingdom of God. If you have any questions or you need to know more, just reach out to us at info at circlechurch.online. You can also reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. Just send us a message. We want to hear from you. We want to come alongside of you and help you in this journey as you grow deeper in your walk with Jesus. We, we love you. We hope that you enjoyed the sermon. I pray that it was a blessing to you. And don't miss part two because I really wasn't able to get to the punchline. And that's the difficult thing about splitting up one sermon into two. I always craft my sermons in such a way that at the end, I'm really driving it home. So I haven't been able to drive it home yet, but we're going to get into the nitty gritty about prayer and, and, and continue furthering the point about biblical prayer and what God wants prayer to look like in our lives next week at 11 a.m. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and enjoy the holiday. Be safe.